we're in part two. We're talking about principles for studying scripture to get ready to preach. <clears throat> Just at the end of the previous session, a question was asked about context, and which was a good question. It anticipated what I want to say about the levels of context to keep in mind when you're looking at a text. There was, uh, during the Second World War, there was a famous aviator, <clears throat> United States named Rickenbacker, who took off from the West Coast. Uh, pardon my map making, but if you can imagine California, <laughs> the West Coast of the United States, and when he took off, what he did not know is that his primitive navigational equipment, which was a manual, was off one degree. <laughs> now, I'm not much of a ge geometrician, but just think about this. If you're off one degree when you leave, and you're supposed to land on a tiny island, a little archipelago out here, what happens the further you go? Hmm? Wider that angle. And Rickenbacker famously had to ditch his plane <laughs> at Y because he was one degree off when he left. I use that as an analogy for ignoring context. Sermons tend to do that. If you ignore the context of the passage in the study and introduction of the sermon, the further you go, <laughs> you may have to bail out <laughs> the sermon because you'll be so far off where you intended to go. Three levels of context, quickly, canonical. That is, where does this fit into the whole of what God is saying in the canon? The canon are those 66 books, no more, no less. It's closed. It's closed. The canon, the canon is those 66 books. Yes, Jesus did say, did say when the comforter comes, when the paraclete comes, going to lead you into new truth, but that truth is not going to contradict the canon of Holy Scripture. Where does this fit into the canon? And that means you have a sense of a biblical timeline. Embedded in your head needs to be a biblical chronology. I uh, don't have time to go in all that, but Genesis 1 through 11, then the period of the patriarchs, you need to understand Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the period of captivity in Egypt, the period of Exodus, the period of conquest, the period of the united monarchy or king, the period of the northern southern kingdom. You need this throughout Scripture in your head so that if you're going to preach from Nehemiah, you've got a great sense of who Nehemiah, when he was and where he was in terms of that biblical timeline. That's during the captivity at the beginning of the Restoration in 444 B.C. And you need in the biblical timeline to understand that Nehemiah didn't leave the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. He wasn't on the ark with Noah. <laughs> he wasn't with Paul and Barnabas. He has a very specific setting in sacred history. And this just goes without saying. Canonical context means you understand the biblical timeline. I'm sure you deal with that here at the Institute. Now, book context is where that passage fits into that Biblical book. I was talking to one of the brothers before about First John. First John three. We send people to read First John for assurance, and then they run into First John three, six and following. If you sin, him known him. Oh my goodness! I mean, unless you have a very light view of sin, you probably sin five times before breakfast. Just in. <laughs> Am I out of the kingdom? The book context has to be taken into account. What's First John 1 say? If we say we have no what? See, you've seen him or know him. It's book context. Then the immediate context. What is immediately before or after that passage? Parable of the labors, Matthew 20. It's case in point. The wallflower of the parable. It's perhaps the most difficult to interpret. A man has a vineyard full of grapes. Remember that. He sends someone at dawn to the marketplace. They agree with laborers. Goes back at 9, noon, 3, 11 in the afternoon. And he gives them all the same wage at the end of the day. You run a business that way, you'd be broke. <laughs> what is that about? It's about the context. Matthew 19, 27, Peter asks a self-serving, self-congratulating question. He looks around Jesus welcoming these 
women to the street, chiseling tax collectors. It's six months before the cross. Everybody can come to the banquet. Peter almost hugs himself to death. It's a terrible way to die, self-hugulation. <laughs> <laughs> he says, well, we left everything to follow you. What are we going to get? No, oh, time card punching, quid quo pro. Yeah. You know what? Jesus gives him that parable. He said, I'll tell you what you're going to get, Peter. You're going to get the same thing as the last one who came in at the 11th hour. 100% of the grace of God. There's no such thing as tenure in the kingdom. It's either all grace or no grace. Well, you don't understand that parable. That parable has literally been used by politicians to justify different kinds of government. I mean, it, it's had a tortured existence by ignoring the clear context, and that is Peter's self-serving question in Matthew 19, 27. What are we going to get out of it? Pete, you're going to get the same thing as the last one in, and that is 100% of the grace of of God, because you can't mix merit and mercy. Okay, that's where immediate context. So, canonical book, immediate context. Now you're down. You've read the text. You've read it in varied translations. You've looked at the context. Now, uh, let's talk about collecting, preserving, expanding notes. You have done your own reading, and you've made notes. Now, if you don't have another system of note-taking, let me suggest the simplest to start with. If you don't have one, halitosis is better than no breath at all. And just have some system uh, of note-taking. Y'all going to get that here. Wake up. Wake up. <laughs> have some system until you have a better one. Now, let me give you an easy system. The Bible's written in chapters and verses. Text or verses. Just try a verse per page until you get a better one. If you're going to start out taking, just say, here's verse 1 and write everything you want to learn about verse 1. You get a better one, you can have a better one, or if you study on cyber on computer, uh, open the files that way. First of all, you want to learn what every word, phrase, and clause in that text meant to the author as best you can. That's called authorial intent. Not what you think the word means, <laughs> but what did Mark, or Luke, or John, or Paul mean? in writing that word. What was the authorial intent? Now let me put a parenthesis here. For those of you who may have a background in philosophy or Derrida or others, you've been told that is impossible to find. Folk call others, you know, you can't find what an author meant. My answer to that is when I'm handling Holy Scripture, I've got to do the best I can. <laughs> I've got to try the best I can to find out what did Mark mean when he wrote this word. You know, I know there's a lot of centuries and a lot of cultural change, but I need to do the best I can. Now that means I must turn to not only what I think the word means, but what reverent biblical exegetes think. Exegesis. Now this comes from the Greek word ex ago, and it means I lead out. An exegete of anything leads the meaning out of the text that is there. Now along with that word, you hear in biblical studies hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is best described as the lens through which I look at the text. All of us have a lens. We, we're born with a lens. You know. Yeah. Uh, here I am. Uh, grew up, was educated in uh, Texas, in the southwest of the United States. I grew up in a southern Baptist culture. All of that handed me a lens. And none of us can rid ourselves completely of a lens. Some people have uh, just to nominate some lens. There's the liberation theology lens. There's the feminist or womanist lens. There's the, uh, the Roman Catholics have a lens. That lens is handed to Catholics by the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church. They say, here's the lens. <laughs> All of us have a lens. It's part of our background, our culture, our very DNA, and we need to be aware of the fact that we bring a lens through which we look at Scripture. 
and to be aware of it as much as a corrective as anything else. In other words, I have to be aware that I bring a certain lens and you bring a lens. I hope that makes sense because you don't look directly at Scripture. You look at it through a lifetime of the accretion of this lens, you know, as a Southern uh, Caucasian, Southern Baptist educated Texan. I bring a lens that uh, is very limited in many ways, very limited. And I've spent my life trying to enlarge that lens, recognizing that people in other places and ages read Scripture from a different viewpoint than I read it. We need to be conscious that all of us bring that lens. And sometimes that lens, just like glasses, <laughs> needs to be corrective, okay? So that I'm not just reading Scripture from, uh, from a point of privilege, recognizing that most people in the world read it uh, from the margins, not from a point of privilege, okay? All kinds of lens stuff. I could, I've got a whole lecture on that. Now, exegesis looks at the text through a lens. Now, the lens I prefer is called the historical grammatical lens, and that is trying to get the plain meaning of the text from the history and grammar of the text. It's called historical grammatical. It's basically evangelical interpretation. What does the history of this word, what does the grammar say? I try to get at the text that way. Now, there are exegetical tools, and these are, I like to use the word reverent, it's a rather large word, but reverent biblical exegetical tools. And that is trained scholarly exegetes who see Scripture as Holy Scripture, Word of God. Now, there's all kinds of commenting that goes on. For example, the Anchor Bible Commentary takes a history of religions approach. Uh, it can help you. Volumes like Raymond Brown's two volumes on John are very helpful, but as a whole, it's not written, say, from an evangelical viewpoint. So I like to commend to you various commentaries that are, and I don't know, some of them have different names in the UCC, but the new International Critical Commentary published by Erdman's in the United States, probably somebody else here, the NICC, that is an evangelical, mid-evangelical commentary written by uh, world-renowned evangelical scholars such as F.F. F. Bruce and others uh, that take Scripture as word of God. Uh, some newer sets in that regard uh, by Baker Press, the Baker Exegetical, uh, uh, not to be outdone there, uh, and these, these are available likely under a different imprint here. The pastor asked me, and I'll send you a bibliography, the Zondervan Exegetical. These are newer evangelical sets that deal word by word, phrase by phrase, with the grammar, the syntax of your text. Spurgeon once said he was surprised at how much some preachers thought of what God told them and how little they thought of what he told anybody else. <laughs> now, exegesis is not a private activity. What did Peter say? No scripture is of what? Private interpretation. The church has been doing this since the apostolic times. And there is a history of handling the Word of God. Now, let me, let me give you this, and I say this half tongue-in-cheek, but it's, it's really true. If you're looking at a New Testament word you're going to preach, and you say that word means something that no other interpreter in Christian history said that word means. Justin Martyr missed it, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Luther, Calvin Knox, and Zwingli, and every commentator missed it, you've discovered that a word means something that no one in church history said it meant. You're probably wrong. <laughs> I'm talking about the meaning of words. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Now, not application or nothing, but if you just, you say, I've discovered, you know, 
that this word, light, means something no one in church history thought it meant. You may want to go back to your prayer closet. <laughs> that, that is, exegesis has a history. And we need to hear what the capital V, I like to use it this way, these books and those like them are the capital V voice of the capital C church. Now, no, 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 don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about what every redaction critic or farm critic said, what the Jesus Seminar said, what Herr Professor Bultmann said. <laughs> I'm talking about what scholars say who take Scripture as holy word of God. All right? That's a different lens. We're talking about lenses. That's their lens. You take a great, a great scholar like F.F. F. Bruce of Manchester. There wasn't any question. <laughs> Taught by his father as an itinerant evangelist uh, for the brethren. <laughs> his whole life, he took Scripture as holy Scripture, Word of God. All right? And you, you develop an ear for that, just in reading commentaries. It doesn't take long, really, to spend time with commentators to say this person reverences Scripture as Word of God, not just a study in comparative religion or hermeneutics. Okay, Now, get yourself these and if you want to look at it as a week's task, a one-week task, and here's another, here's some marginalia. I've been talking about it conceptually. Let's talk about it temporally or chronologically because getting ready to preach happens across time. If you have a plan to preach, you've got something set aside. Monday, Monday is a day for a relaxed reading of the text. Generally, preachers have to get over Sunday. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's a reality. It's a... Uh, uh, the great Dr. Gardner C. Taylor passed away Easter Sunday morning. Uh, one of the icons of the world pulpit, the great African-American preacher, Gardner Calvin Taylor, died Easter Sunday. It's amazing. Um, went to be with the Lord. You know, the, he was often interviewed about preaching, and he would frustrate reporters. They said, well, what do you do? And he said, well, I preach, I get over preaching, and I get ready to preach again. And he frustrated interviewers. He said, no, no, what do you do? And he said, I just said, I preach. I get over preaching, get ready to preach again. Monday doesn't need to be diving in the deep end of the pool. <laughs> uh, Monday is a good day for a relaxed reading of your text. You know, get a cup of coffee, keep on your robe and slippers. Relaxed reading. You're not trying to dive in the deep end. You're just trying to read it and get better acquainted with it. Tuesday and Wednesday are good days for close reading. And that is not only your own best study, but listening to the voice of the church. And these are just representative of many. They're not the only ones, of many. I could comment on commenting the rest of the day. But listening and taking notes to what the voice of the church says about words, phrases, clauses, grammar, syntax, background, cultural folkways and mores that give light to the text. Okay, Tuesday and Wednesday. Now my goal is this, and when I get ready to preach, is to know something about every operative word, phrase, and clause in the text. Let me say that again. I've got the text. It is to know something about every operative word, phrase, and clause. Now, am I going to take all that to the pulpit? Absolutely not. It would drown the people. You know, no preacher can, <laughs> you want to be exhaustive in that sense, you'll exhaust everybody. You say, I'm going to tell you everything I know about every word, phrase, and clause in this text. No, 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 no. The congregation has the right to expect that you know more than you tell them. Let me give you an analogy of that. If I go to a doctor and say, doctor, my, my knee hurts, I don't want him to give me a blank stare and say, oh, let me get my book on knees. No, 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 no. No, I want him just to skim the surface of what he knows about the human knee. I don't want to feel like he's told me everything he knows. I certainly don't want to feel like he told me more than he knows. I want to feel like he's just skimming the surface. And that, I think the people have the right to f expect that of the preacher. You're gathering more than you'll ever use. F.B. Meyer, the great devotional preacher, uh, 
uh, of, of the city said, said, the art of exposition is the art of elimination. The art of exposition is the art of elimination. It's what you leave out of everything you know. But you can't eliminate anything unless you know more. <laughs> so make it your goal to find what every word, phrase, and clause in that text means notated. So that when you read the text yourself, you can do an expanded reading through the text to yourself, to yourself. Does that make sense? Now, you've accumulated these notes Tuesday, Wednesday. But here, what are you going to do with it? Let's go to part three. Backbone, not jellyfish in the pulpit. How are you going to take this stuff and structure it in order to say it? <laughs> Between part two and part three of this little outline, there's not a sermon yet. You've got a lot of notes, but the sermon is like the earth in Genesis 1. It's without form and void. <laughs> You have a lot of notes, but that's not in any classical sense the sermon just to get up and to give a just Bible study notes. You've got a lot of notes, but what turns those notes into a sermon? In a way, how do you get across that bridge we were talking about? Right now, all you've got is stuff from the then was there part of that bridge. You've only got half a bridge. Uh, you know, as uh, <laughs> the, uh, the city of Avignon, and, and if you've ever seen the river that run, is half a bridge over that river. Uh, it's, it's an old bridge, and half of it fell in the river centuries ago. It's a half a bridge. But all you have here is a half a bridge. All that stuff about thinness, how do you get it into mountains? How do you get over the bridge? Now, a good deal of what I'm about to say, I owe to Haddon Robinson. And if I were to encourage you to get a single homiletic text, get his text, Biblical Preaching. It's one of the best-selling texts in history in preaching called Biblical Preaching. This is kind of Gregory's take on Robinson. You got all this stuff, what are you going to do with it? Well, you need to find what Haddon calls the big idea. Now, at other times, this has been called the thesis. That's fallen out of usage. It sounds too academic. It's earlier than that been called even the proposition. It's been called the sermon in a sentence. Tom Long, the Presbyterian, calls it the focus statement. Uh, a rose by any other name. <laughs> still arose, and that is a single sentence as clear as the moon on a cloudless night about what you're going to say. Now, the widest variety of preachers do this. There must be something to it. Uh, say in the United States, a mainline liberal Protestant lady uh, uh, that, that uh, Barbara Brown Taylor, who lives in a different theological world from me, says at the top of every sermon, she writes this sentence. An evangelical like Haddon Robinson says, you've got to have this. A Presbyterian like Tom Long says, you've got to have it. On and on and on, you've got to have it. Okay? Now, thesis, whatever this is. Now, how do you find it? Well, there's two parts. What is the subject of my text? That's the subject, and what am I going to say about this text? That is the compliment. All human speaking exists of that. Let me give you an example. If I say Jack and Jill, that's a subject, but it's not a compliment. Now, if I say Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water, I've said something specific about Jack and Jill. Now, to get to the sermon, this is the prime move. This is, this is unavoidable. You can't go over it, under it, or around it for clear preaching. What is the big subject that my text is about? Now, that may be one or two words. You know. This is about the Holy Spirit. 
But if I get up and say, today, I'm going to preach to you the truth about the Holy Spirit, you're going to exhaust one person of the Trinity in 45 minutes? No, no, no. That's a subject. It might be any one aspect of the Spirit. For example, the Spirit as a seal. <laughs> Sealed to the day of redemption. The sphragis, that great work. Sealed, guaranteed. Then I have a subject and a complement. Does that make sense? The Spirit is sealed. You have to decide. Now this is sometimes harder in long narrative passages. Okay? Say I'm preaching from early in the life of Joseph. His father's favorite, sold into slavery by his brothers, bought by Potiphar, <laughs> thrown <laughs> into prison when he does the right thing. It's, it's tough to be in prison for doing the wrong thing. It's worse when you do the right thing. Thrown into prison because of Mrs. Potiphar. But, 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 VIP prisoners show up. I don't know where he gets thrown in, the, in jail. Here's the butler and the baker. He interprets their dreams. You know the story. Pharaoh has a dream. <laughs> he tries his astrologers, his soothsayers, you know, gets on the Internet, Googles it, does everything. Can't find his dream. And what does the, what does the, uh, what does the butler say? Ah, ah, wait a minute, I got a business card. <laughs> Forgot this man. You got a dream interpreter in your jail. Now, that's a long story. You have to decide in preaching that narrative, what in the world is this about? <laughs> or it flies apart in too many directions, all right? So you're going to have to read that and read it and think, what really is the subject of this early life of Joseph, okay? Well, the subject as I read it has something to do uh, with, with God's timing. Now that's not, and I want to underscore this, that's not the only subject that's there. But what I want to preach about is God's timing. That's the subject. Isn't it so strange, that series of events, one degree at a time, that God, him, if you rewound his life, if you press the rewind button, replay, you find out that he would have never have been the chief operating officer of Egypt if every one of those things hadn't happened to him. So it's God's timing, okay? Okay. Now, what do I want to say about God's timing? What I want to say about it is God's timing works when <laughs> you cannot see it. Now, is that the only sermon there? No, not at all. But that's a sermon. You think Joseph saw it when his brothers sold him to those slave traders? You think he said, <laughs> I'm on my way to be the COO of Egypt. No. <laughs> you think he saw it when Mrs. Potiphar, who is on the original cast of Desperate Housewives, do you think <laughs> do you think that you think when she was chasing him around the house, he said, That's okay. Uh, I'm going to be COO of Egypt. No. You read that story. He didn't know that. Until that day when there was a knock on the door of the jail when he thought he'd been totally forgotten. Somebody said, the butler remembered you. Clean up. You're going to see Pharaoh and interpret a dream. Now, you get at that by saying, what is this big narrative about? God's timing. Well, what am I going to say about it? It works even when you cannot see it. Now, is that the only sermon? Not at all. Scripture is thick. It's deep. It's textured. But that's, a, that's the sermon I want to preach out of that big narrative. And in some ways, it's harder to do it out of narratives than it is out of shorter passages. Walter Kaiser calls this principalizing principalizing. He made up a word. What are the principles, the principalizing in this big narrative? So you're going to struggle with all of those notes you have to find the subject and the complement. Okay? 
Now, let me give you one or two other examples, because example is better than the concept in this regard. Let's say I'm preaching from Luke 5, that wonderful little story about Jesus. He's just, according to Matthew, just preached the Sermon on the Mount. He's leaving. He's walking through the crowds. A leper <laughs> runs up to him, falls before him, begs him. And Jesus astonishes the crowd by reaching out and what? Touching a leper. Now, there's a number of ways to preach that. But the big image in biblical leprosy, the image that is always latent there is contagion. <laughs> leprosy is contagious. I'm sure when Jesus reached out and touched that man, everyone, <gasps> the audible gasp, you know. <sighs> Here's this wonderful young rabbi gone giving himself leprosy. No, no, no. Now, the subject of my sermon is going to be contagion. But the compliment that I want to use to organize this sermon is Jesus is more contagious than anything he touches. <laughs> you don't, you don't. <laughs> when he touches a greedy person, you don't make him the greedy Jesus. <laughs> no, no. No, when he touches a leper. Leper doesn't give him leprosy. He gives that leper wholeness. Okay? Now, there's a lot of ways to preach that passage, but my sermon is going to be around the big idea of contagion, and that is Jesus is more contagious than anything he touches. Now, that's not the only sermon. Don't hear this say you're looking for one, the only sermon that exists, but you need clarity in your concept. This gives the sermon one of the two big things a sermon must have, and that is unity. The biggest struggle I have in teaching preaching at the seminary level is this struggle, unity. What is this sermon about? Have you ever heard a sermon that begins with Adam and Eve leaving the Garden of Eden? You go through the Tower of Babel float on the ark with Noah. You kill Goliath with David, roar with Amos, walk with Jesus in Galilee, and wind up with Paul in the shipwreck <laughs> off of Malta. And you say, what in the world <laughs> is this sermon about? <laughs> the single diagnostic at the front door of a sermon is this Subject and compliment. Now, one or two prescriptive things about it. Let me give you an acronym of how to state this. Present tense, active voice, indicative or declarative statement. Present tense, active voice, indicative. That means those are the same things. It makes a statement, indicative or declarative. Now, it's present tense because that helps you get out of then into now. God's timing, that's the subject, works in your life even when you're not aware of it. Now, I could have stated that the grandson of Abraham the patriarch was imprisoned in Egypt. That's true, and I'm going to talk about that. But how many people, I'm just talking about the guy who wakes up and comes to church Sunday morning. How many people come just on fire to know what happened <laughs> to a Jew <laughs> 3,800 years ago? I woke up this morning wanting to know what happened to the grandson of Abraham. <laughs> no. Now, that is important, but for me to throw it in the lap of the typical congregant who got up and got there, I need to state it, present tense, active voice statement. I can't underscore how important this is. God's timing is at work in your life, even though you don't know it's happening. Now, I'm going to tell them the story, but I'm going to tell it to them under that umbrella that moves it out of what? Thenness into now. Does that make sense? 
very important that you state that big idea in your own mind, and as we talk about it, as we have time, state it in the event of preaching. Very clearly, in the present tense, active voice, declarative statement. Now let me give you another metaphor about how all of this works. Oh, this to H. Grady Davis, the idea of the sermon tree. Here is a tree, avoid the art, but here's the tree. It roots in the text. The trunk is this solid big idea. Roots in the text. The trunk is this big idea that governs the sermon. And the branches organically grow out of that big idea. You don't have to make them grow out. They organically grow out. The big idea is germinative. It's seminal. It has growing capacity. Now, now let, me, let me use my little narrative sermon as an example about Joseph. God's timing is at work in your life even when you don't know it. Well, how is that so? Okay. Here's move number one, branch number one. God's timing is at work. Even when the people closest to you turn against you. Brothers selling their brother down the interstate highway to Egypt. And I'm going to develop that. But is that all? No. God's timing works when you try to do right and it turns out wrong. I mean, you know, uh, here's Joseph. Everything's going great at Potiphar's house. Stocks up, bonds up. You know, Potiphar's turned the whole thing over to him. Here, here's the keys to my Bentley. Here's the safe to the water. You know, everything's yours except Miss Potiphar. Joe says, that's fine. And he does the right thing, and it turns out wrong. See, that grows out of that. Move number three, growing out of that big idea. God is putting people in your future that you don't even know about to get you where he wants to get you. That's the butler and the baker. Now, all of that grows out of this big idea naturally, okay? Okay. Now, what if I were preaching that and all of a sudden I said, in light of that, God wants you to tithe right now. <laughs> what would be wrong with that? Huh? What would, now this may be wrong with tithe, but what would be wrong with that? Hmm? I don't know. Have you ever seen, been looking at a beautiful tree? I don't know if that happens a great deal here, but in fact, have you ever seen a kite caught in a tree? Is your first response is, my, my, that uh, tree grew a kite. <laughs> no. What happened? Hmm? That doesn't belong there. Now, what I'm inveighing against here is kite in the tree <laughs> preaching, and we've all heard it. You're following along a sermon, a sermon, a sermon. All of a sudden, where did that come from <laughs> in this text? This is an organic approach. Roots in the text. Grows with the sturdy trunk of a big idea and organically, organically grows into several movements or points, as they used to say, or divisions. I like the word movement because that's what they're doing. Okay? All right. Now, big idea gives the sermon unity. So far, we've dealt with the roots and the trunk. Now, how do you move through the text? The big idea gives its unity, but a sermon is a speech event in time, and you're moving through a text in time. So let's talk, let's, let's transition here from the big idea, which gives the sermon unity, to the other necessity in preaching along with unity, and that is movement. Movement. A sermon has to have unity, but if you go to the piano and just hit middle C over and over for 30 minutes, people are going to wish that you'd moved around a little bit on the keyboard. And as a sermon, both in your preparation and in the delivery that needs unity, but movement, moving through the text in time. How do you move through the text under the umbrella of unity? Now, uh, a little bit of slow plotting here, but it's just about the way people think. Most of the time, 
even today, evangelicals preach deductively. That is, you move from the general to the particular. You put the big idea out there very clearly at the beginning of the sermon. You're not trying to hide it, not making it covert. After somewhere in the introduction, you tell them the big idea. Yes, church, we're going to see from this text, <laughs> we're going to see that God's timing is at work in your life, even when you don't know it. You're going to put it right out there. That's deductive preaching. Not trying to hide it, not trying to veil it, putting it out there. And then the sermon is a series of moves, like the branches in my tree, that support that big idea. I just did a book for the uh, Baptist World Alliance, an uh, organization, a network of Baptists in uh, nearly 200 countries. and uh, We called it Global Baptist Preaching. It was six sermons each from Africa, South America, North America, Europe, Caribbean, Asia, Pacific Rim. Didn't tell them what to submit. We just chose preachers. You had 36 just chose us, just sent us a sermon. Well, 75% of them were deductive. 75% without asking anybody. Now, the ones that tended not to be deductive were from Europe and North America. We'll talk about that in a minute. But 75% were deductive. Here's what it is, and I'm going to support it. Now, since the 1970s, particularly in mainline Protestantism, particularly, there has been an emphasis on inductive preaching. And that is, you don't tell them what you're going to tell them. <laughs> Induction, here's item, 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 item. Therefore, here is the big idea. Now, in inductive preaching, according to the late Fred Craddock, who just went to be with the Lord, disciple of Christ, homiletician, Inductive preaching is taking them on the journey you went on in discovering what the text means, but not telling them <laughs> until the end. As he famously put it, at the end of the sermon, the congregation doesn't know whether you said it or they thought it. <laughs> Interesting approach, and that is you take them through particulars, but at the end of the sermon, you get the same place. Now, uh, let me give, uh, in a sense, uh, <laughs> an example of that from a Craddock sermon. If you listen to sermons on YouTube, it's better to watch it than to explain it in many ways. But Fred would keep you in suspense. He's preaching from Mark's account of the baptism of Jesus. Uh, of Jesus. When all the people were baptized, Jesus was baptized. He sets the context. He reads that. But the but first thing out of Fred's mouth is, I don't like lines. I don't like lines anywhere. I don't like lines of cars. I don't like lines at the grocery store. I just don't like lines. It says the only thing about lines is it just makes everybody so equal. So I'll tell you the kind of lines I like. Everybody with a BA getting this line. Everybody with an MA. Everybody with a PhD. That's the kind of line I like. Everybody who makes more than $70,000 getting a line, everybody less getting a line. See, that way you don't have to be so equal. The problem about lines is they make everybody so equal. Now, you have to think about what is the church thinking while I'm saying this. And that's what he's thinking. He's thinking about thinking. And he's thinking about the congregation. The congregation's thinking, what in the world is this man talking about lines? Ah, oh, but he's very, very shrewd about it. He says, you know, it looks like when you read this text, there was a line there that day. People lined up. And he goes down the line using Mark and Luke. Look, look who's in that line. Why, the religious people were in that line. And he says, oh, the Jerusalem, the leaders came out. And he develops that. The poor were in that line. Luke says soldiers were in that line. Now he's going down the line, item, item, item. You're still not sure where things are going. He says, you know, it's interesting that the poor people, the clergy, the, the soldier, but you know, Jesus was, Jesus was in that line, isn't it? Strange that Jesus would get in that line. Standing there between a prostitute and a tax collector in a line he didn't belong in. 
But see, he wanted you to know that if you're going to follow him, you all have to get into the same line. Next. And then he sat down. The last word in the sermon was next. People were just stunned. I was in the room when he preached it. I mean, the last word of the sermon was next. <laughs> now, that is inductive preaching. And this has been a big debate. It's been a debate among homileticians. Fred was absolutely opposed to deduction. He says, you're making it too obvious. He said, you're telling them what you're going to tell them. They need to go on the discovery with you. Um, uh, I understand what he's saying, uh, but I've never bought into it completely because inductive preaching is an art form. You know, uh, it really is an art form. Deductive preaching is more achievable for more preachers more of the time. I think one reason you know it's an art form is because when people talk about it, they always say, well, just, just go listen to one of Craddock's sermons. <laughs> you know, that's kind of like saying, you know, I'd like to paint. Well, good, you go to the museum and, and study Rembrandt, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's an art form. Now, deductive preaching works best where the congregation has a high respect for the authority of the minister and the Word of God. Inductive preaching works best when you have pushback or resistance, for example, if I preach at a required denominational university chapel, I'm facing 2,000 people who do not want to be there. <laughs> they don't. They're required to be there. Even, even, it's something about even Christian students. I don't know. They're required to be there. They're reading papers. They're on their iPads. Then I may want to be inductive, okay, be, to try to sneak up, try to sneak up on them. Uh, indirectly. You can study all about this. Haddon Robinson, Biblical Preaching, the Bible of Deductive Preaching, uh, Fred Craddock's remarkable 1970s book that's been revised several times, As One Without Authority, Inductive Preaching. Now, the other large school of preaching today says a, says a pox on both of your houses. Uh, the Bible is largely narrative. Not altogether, but there are many narratives. This school of thought says if you look at either one of these, they look like a building project. They don't look like a living thing. You know. So the narrative school, as represented by Eugene Lowry, came up with the idea of a loop. It works well because it's like the ichthus, the fish symbol, on its, on its tail. It's kind of the Lowry, the... Uh, Lowry loop, and what they did with it, instead of doing that, he turned it, he turned it around and he put it <laughs> kind of upside down ichthus like that. And he says, look at stories. How do stories usually work? He says, stories usually begin with things are okay. Now his students gave this word, okay. Things are okay. But then something upsets the equilibrium. Hmm. His students call that oops. A story starts, okay, something upsets the equilibrium. Now, things get worse. There's a descending part of a plot. And this is really true whether it's Seinfeld or Shakespeare or sitcom, whatever. Things get worse. Then often there's an aha uh -huh moment. Ah, I see what's going to happen. See that? Then things get better. His students call that we, we, you know, there, there's, and then there's an almost an aftermath of a story usually. It's the yay, the uh, how does it work out? Or the French, what is it called, the denouement, the, 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 the kind of the working out. Now this is interesting how stories, let's just talk about narrative, story. A narrative is a story. It's where you have a story and a storyteller, a cause and effect. You know you have a narrative if there's a tale and a teller, a cause and effect that moves through time. Now, just try this on, say, some biblical narratives, where maybe you don't want to structure it this, this tightly, because life doesn't necessarily happen in points. <laughs> Life's messy. So here's, uh, here's David. Let's talk about David's great fall. David's about 47. 
He's the king. Everything's okay. It's good to be the king. <laughs> but you can almost sense the oops coming. In the spring, when kings go forth to war, what does Dave do? He sends the army out. He said, I'm king. King's bigger than it's ever been. Good to be the king. <laughs> oops. Walking on the roof, he spies Bathsheba, and there's a whole lot there. He, 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 uh, he really is the guilty party because in that culture, for her to be on, uh, the, on the roof and bathing was not to be invaded. He was the king. He was in the position of power over her. He looked down on her. It was very invasive use of power. He sends her a, a text message, happy hour at the palace, 5 o'clock. Dress business casual. <laughs> Sends her a text message. Well, you can see here, ugh, but I mean, this is one of the great uggs in all of Scripture because what happened? I mean, it's ugh, 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 ugh. You know, uh, she, uh, <laughs> a few weeks later, sends him an email. <laughs> uh, says, uh, you remember the uh, happy hour. <laughs> Th this is a loose translation. I'm sorry. <laughs> But uh, he gets the email. <laughs> what does he do? He, uh, he sends for who? Uriah. For obvious adult reasons. And Uriah will not even go into his own house. So he sends him back with his own death notice. One of the, I mean, how this guy ever got called a man after God's own heart. It gives the rest of us a lot of grace. Because this was a bad dude. Now. At the very bottom, he sends him back with his own death notice. Now, what's the, at the bottom of the ug, what's the aha? Great aha. Here's Nathan, the palace prophet. And it's interesting, you understand what Nathan is saying. But David doesn't. It's wonderful, even in the literary composition. I'm sure everybody in the court understood what he was saying. The little parable of the sheep, one man had one little ewe lamb. And what does David say? Get him! Well, I'm sure all the courtiers were here saying, he's talking about David. <laughs> There's a big idea there, too. The big idea is sin makes you dumb. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, really does. David doesn't see it until he finally says, I mean, you see the aha. Yeah, that, that, he's talking about David, the sheep. That's not about a sheep. <laughs> aha. And then what is the we? To David's credit, he doesn't say, look, I'm the king. Uh, King do what they want to. What does he say? I have sin. And Nathan says, God is going to absolve the guilt of sin. Well, the we is that he acknowledges it, but the yay is way out there somewhere. I mean, there's not much yay. Family torn up. Hell is unleashed in their household. If there's any yay, the yay is way out the door over here. It's in Matthew's genealogy, as you know. And that is one of the progenitors. The human side of Jesus is, she didn't even get her name. I don't know why. It's just the wife of Uriah in Matthew's genealogy. God took that whole thing up into his purposes. Unbelievably. Took it up into his larger purpose. Now that's narrative. And if you preach narratively, you kind of keep something like this in your mind. Sometimes it's just too heavy-handed to say, first of all, I want you to know this principle, and then this principle. Sometimes telling the story, telling the story, uh, honors the narrative. The book here, and I'll send a bibliography, is Eugene Lowry, called The Homiletic Plot, How to Preach Narratives. This kind of organic treatment of a narrative. Keeping in mind, narratives start with things, okay, oops, ugh, aha, we, yay. We could, we could spend a lot of time on it. The great narrative of Elijah and Mount Carmel going back, facing Jezebel, running away to the desert, hearing the still small voice. All of that fits into this same kind of narrative structure. This is just the way things tend to happen in many narratives. Now, not, not perfectly. You know, some secular narratives, so forth. You know, like, like, uh, 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 some, well, many of Shakespeare's plays will, will have part, part of this. Uh, some of them have all of it, but that's a whole other, that's a whole other question. Hamlet, you know, Hamlet, 
This works pretty well with Hamlet, uh, uh, all the way down to the play in the play, where his guilty uncle <laughs> shown what's happened. You get the aha. Uh, uncle finally gets it. But the, the, the we and the yay are not too good since everybody winds up dead on the stage. But, uh, but, uh, but, but, but it kind of follows that plot. So three ways to organize your preaching. Deductive. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Put the big idea out there at the beginning. Inductive. Give them little pieces. Take them on the journey you went through in the text and suspend the big idea. Or narrating the text. Trusting the story. Now, did you hear what I did in that narrative? You were laughing, but I did it deliberately. I said, David sent a what? Text message. Now, why did I do that? That's called anachronistic exposition. Most people sitting out there in the congregation know he didn't send a text message. Now, about one out of 100 will come out of the church door and say, I, I didn't know they could do that then. <laughs> and all about all you can do is say, well, bless your heart. Bless your heart. <laughs> Lord bless you. And go back next Sunday. Don't, don't let other people's lack of imagination kill your creativity. When you're giving biblical narratives, one way to give them is with anachronistic exposition. Okay? If you're preaching on the man who needs bigger barns, preach the story, but use your imagination a little. You know. Say, look, there were three plaques on his wall. Three plaques. A.D. 30, Bethlehem, Farmer of the Year. <laughs> A.D. 31, all Judea farmer of the year. And then A.D. 32, all Israel farmer of the year. A man like that needs bigger barns. Now, once again, you run the risk of somebody saying, did they really make plaques then? <laughs> <laughs> but use a little bit of anachronistic exposition, talking about thenness in terms of nowness. Does that make sense? Trust the people to understand. They weren't sending text messages in the Iron Age. <laughs> okay, all right? Now, let's pause now because this is, I've just leaped through stuff. We take weeks to talk about in my classes. But we're t for anything we've covered here from exegesis, hermeneutics, commentaries, uh, ways to organize material moving through the sermon. Anybody jump in? Because this is a whole lot of stuff. Um, yes. Joel, I'd like you, you to, to comment on something which I think has been implicit in what you've said before in approaching a text and developing that text in, into a sermon. What is the, the place of theology? Okay. Yes. What is the place of theology? And that is, and I would call that the larger context of your thought, the as a psychologist, maybe the gestalt, the blick, the whole big picture, the atmosphere in which you preach. The theology is going to be, first of all, and that, that's a very good question. If I go back to my idea of lens, theology gives you your hermeneutic. Theology hands you your lens. So if I could I'd make an example, it would be better than, than just concept. If I am a post, and I'm talking about in American terms, a post-liberal mainline Protestant, a post-liberal mainline Protestant, <laughs> I belong to a denomination, very, very frankly, the big five mainline Protestant denomination, most of whom jettisoned the idea of biblical authority a long time ago. I've got an insight. Paul had an insight. You know, I read this in the New Yorker. It's kind of a mishmash. That's my theology my theology. My theology says my insights equal C to Paul. If I'm a typical evangelical, it says uh, my theology is that I'm under the lordship of Christ and an infallible scripture. That gives me a different lens. You know, if I'm dealing with current social issues, it's not, it's not how can I endorse what the cultures say. It's what does the word of God say? I'm under the authority of that word of God. So I would say in terms of my metaphor call and the lens, theology hands me my lens. Does that, does that help? Because I'm looking through that at the, at the text. 
Yes, it's very important to have a good theology because that, well, it's like the, the tint of your glasses almost. I mean, you wear rose-colored glasses, everything's going to look rosy. <laughs> you know, and it, it tints everything you do. And let me put it another way, and sometimes I do this. There are three positions you can take with reference to the Word of God. This is a little Gideon Testament. I was very pleased they handed these out at the college where I am uh, up in Oxford. And we were there on it the other day, and I picked up one of them. You can stand over it. Now, there are preachers who stand over the Word of God. These, quite frankly, are preachers who use it, taking text out of context and use the Word of God. Uh, it's, it's, it's an, to me, abusive preaching. I'm over this Word, and I'll use it to say whatever I want to make it say. That's all kinds of heterodox, apostate preaching stands over it. Now, another view is to stand alongside of it. Now, this is the view of mainline liberal Protestantism, and that is, well, Paul had some insights, <laughs> John has some good theories, but the sermon really is a clever dialogue between me <laughs> and the Scripture, or to be perceived as standing under the Word you proclaim. Now, to me, this is the evangelical theology. In other words, I am bound by this, this word. And when I say that, what, you always have, the word evangelical has become so slippery because in the states it has now not only a, a theological but also a political meaning, which you have to be very careful there to define it. And that is, I stand under the authority of Scripture in the great tradition of the world church, what has been believed at all times by all Christians. Uh, in all places. Yeah. Well, that's a different stance from standing over it or alongside of it. I'm under it. And, and I think this also helps the preacher in authenticity of preaching today. People sense, particularly millennials sense, if you're using Scripture to manipulate them or if you're just in a dialogue with it. Part of your own perception as an authentic proclaimer needs to be that you're under the same word that you're proclaiming, not over it, alongside it, but under it. People I'm often ask, how do you get heard today in an anti-authority age? And at the front door of that is, you must be perceived to be under the authority of what you're saying. I don't know, does that get at that a bit? No. When, when talking about then, bringing it to now, mm -hmm. Any tips when handling passages that were written then about the future and bringing that mm -hmm. into now relevance? Right. Well, now you're talking about there, I would take it to some degree, predictive, uh, predictive prophecy. Would that be what you'd have in mind? Mm. Yeah. Well, of course, you've got, in a sense, two levels. That's bivalent. You've got Old Testament predictive prophecy that predicted things about the Messiah. But then you've got both Old and New Testament passages that, that, that are looking into the sheer, into the future. You know. uh, no, I want to be, I want to be careful in that regard. In this regard, that what I say sits well with the voice of the church for all times. You know, uh, it's very easy to get off into a, a sidewater, a very insular, very parochial, very edgy. Uh, in using predictive prophecy. For example, say, say concerning passages concerning the return of the Lord Jesus. Is that, is that what you'd have in mind, something like that? Hmm. Yeah. Well, there's some things that, that, that are unequivocal you can't argue with. You know. uh, it's going to be personal. Just like in Acts 1 at the Ascensions, this same Jesus. <laughs> when he comes, it's not going to be Jesus number two would be the same Jesus. Uh, it's going to be instant. Instant. You know, as lightning shines out of the east into the west. There, there's about it. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, that great word in, in the blinking of a night, it's literally the word atomos. gives us the word Adam and what to them the, an atomic, the smallest divisible amount of time. Instant. Now, I'm on good grounds you know, when I start saying that. I may not be on as good grounds, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, please understand, I'm not trying to mock anybody's eschatology. I've heard plenty of that, 
I'm not trying to, but I may not be as good grounds if I just get obsessed with the fact that you have got to have the ashes of a red heifer in order to rebuild the temple. We actually have a man in East Texas growing uh, a, uh, a herd of red heifers to be sure that when they dedicate the new temple, they will have a red heifer. That strains a bit. <laughs> now, that has not necessarily been believed by the whole church at all times and all places. But if I say Jesus is returning personally, visibly, instantly, <laughs> uh, then I'm on good ground. But I'm trying to hear the voice of the church. And, and I think one thing, and this is just this is just free for what it's worth. One thing that has almost killed eschatological preaching in the mainline churches in America have been excesses, you know, predictive excesses, so that in whole denominations it's not even mentioned anymore as a reaction to the predictive excesses, which is a tragedy. You don't have New Testament Christianity without the living hope that this same Jesus will come again in like manner. You know, some golden daybreak. He's coming again in like manner. I mean, that is the Christian hope. You don't have biblical Christianity without that. But I think in preaching predictive prophecy, you need to ask, where am I standing with the church at all times, all places, everywhere? Otherwise, you can very quickly fall off into <laughs> some kind of ravine or get caught in some kind of backwater that when it doesn't happen, and unfortunately, all kinds of things have been said in my lifetime that didn't happen. Then what you have is uh, people cynicized. They're cynical about any predictive preaching. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. Because you can handle Scripture predictively. I mean, just like, just like the great so-called Olivet Discourse when the disciples pointed to the temple and said, oh, doesn't that look good, Jesus? As if he'd never seen it. It was his house, you know. <laughs> he said, yeah. He said, yes, but not one, not one stone is going to be left on the other. And then he gives the whole program in the sense of the Christian church there. He says, many are going to come in my name. Well, that's gone on for 20 centuries. He says, uh, many are going to, their hearts are going to grow cold. They're going to fall away. That's gone. 20 centuries. <laughs> he says, they're going to be uh, signs, earthquakes in diverse places. Well, that's going on in the 20th century. He's talking about what's going to characterize the age when he comes. And he makes a very clear statement. He said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached where? To the ends of the earth. And then what? Hmm? The end comes. Now, here's, here's, here's the problem with so much eschatological preaching. There's an earthquake and more earthquakes. And people say, this is it. No. He said they're going to be earthquakes. False messiahs. He said that's always going to be. So we put an emphasis to me on things that uh, uh, he predicted and avoid really the one sign that Jesus gave of the end. He said when this gospel is preached to the ends of the earth, then the end will come. That's solid exegetical preaching. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm.